Hello guys, let's talk about the Bohr model. So Niels Bohr in 1913 proposed a new model of the atom, which is also called the Bohr model or the planetary model. And you guys are all familiar with this because you can see this literally everywhere. So this is an example of the planetary model of the lithium atom. We know that lithium has three electrons and all those three electrons are orbiting the nucleus in the center in specific allowable path. And these are called orbits. Now, if we pancake this on a paper, this is how it's going to look like. We are going to have the nucleus in the middle and then these orbits right here with n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3. For the hydrogen atom, since we have only one electron there, n equals 1 is going to be the ground state, the coziest state where the electron likes to live. And all the other states states where the electron can jump up if it gets extra energy is called the excited state. Now, a really cool way of imagining this model is just simply using a ladder. So just like when you are climbing up on a ladder, electrons can leave on these orbits, but they cannot be between those lines. So for example, if you have an electron on n equals one, which is right here. So for hydrogen, this is n equals one, the ground state, the lowest energy state. Now you can have a photon with just enough energy hit that electron to make it get excited. So it's actually going to transition from the first ground state to one of the excited states. Let's say that it transitioned to n equals 4 to this excited state, right? So n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4. So this means that my atom absorbed energy and the electron transitioned from the n equals 1 ground state to the n equals 4 excited state in a hydrogen atom. In the pancaked model, we can look at it this way. We have an electron right here. Light comes in with just enough energy to get absorbed and the electron moves up to further away from the nucleus. Okay, so what happens next to the electron? Well, the electron is like, oh, I'm excited, I'm so happy, but I don't know how long can I keep this energy, right? Maybe it cannot stay there for too long. So it can transition back to lower energy levels or to lower orbits. And when it does, it can go, for example, to n equals three, n equals two, or back, to n equals 1, so up to the ground state. Now, where does the energy go? Well, in order for the electron to get excited, we had to absorb energy. So when we are transitioning to lower energy states or lower energy orbits, we are going to need to release this energy. And this energy is released in a form of light or photons. So when we go from n equals th 4 to n equals 3, we will emit a photon. When we go from 4 to 2, we will emit a photon, but you can see that actually the energy gap is higher, so it's going to be at a different spot on an electromagnetic spectrum, creating a line spectrum. And then when we go from n equals 4 to n equals 1, right down there, we are again going to emit a photon, which has an even higher energy. Okay, so this is basically how line spectra are created. And Niels Bohr used the following formula. So he said that the change in energy for the electron equals to the final energy state minus the initial energy state, which equals to the Rydberg constant given in joules multiplied by 1 over n final squared minus 1 over 
n initial squared. So n final and n initial are the numbers given to these orbits. So for example, when we are going from n equals 4 to n equals to 1, my n initial is going to be 4 and my n final is going to equal to 1. Now I also said that the energy is the lowest at the ground state at n equals 1 state. And actually the energy has a negative sign. So for example, at n equals 1, we can have an energy of minus 200 joules. And at n equals 4, we can have an energy of minus 50 joules, right? So the energy increases as we go up and up and up on these orbits. Now keep in mind that in these figures, the orbits are spaced equally from each other, but in reality, the spacing becomes smaller and smaller and smaller between all orbits as you increase and increase the energy. But my point is, if we go from n equals 4 to n equals 1, and the energy for n equals 1 is minus 200, right? That is our final state. So minus 200 joules. And we subtract from it the energy of the initial state, which is 50 joules minus, minus 50 joules. We are going to get minus 150 joules. So literally, when the electron transitions from a higher to a lower energy state, energy is released in a form of a photon, and the change in energy is going to have a negative sign. Now, similarly, if we go from a lower energy state, just like going from n equals 1 to n equals 4, right here, we are going to absorb energy. So the change in energy is actually going to be positive. All right, I hope this makes sense. Now, let's look at the limitations of the Bohr model. So it works really well for atoms that contain only one electron, just like hydrogen or helium plus, but it doesn't work at all if you have more than one electron. In addition to it, it cannot explain the difference between the intensities of the produced spectral lines, meaning that there are some transitions when you are coming down in energy are more favored than others. We cannot tell why. Moreover, based on classical physics, if you have a negatively charged particle, just like an electron moving around in a positive electric field, and in this case it can be created by a nucleus, the electron, the negatively charged particle, should emit energy. So as it moves around the nucleus, at some point it should fall into the nucleus, right? Because it is emitting energy constantly. But it doesn't happen. We know that because atoms are stable. So what did Bohr say about this? He simply assumed that it would not. Why not? It's just a model. On top of that, Bohr's model wouldn't work with the famous uncertainty principle devised by Heisenberg. So he said that we cannot assign the position and the momentum of the electron at the same time. This means basically that if we know how fast the electron is going, we don't know where it is and vice versa. Okay, And he gave this expression right here. So the change in position multiplied by the change in momentum, you are going to see this sometimes given as delta P. That's the change in momentum, which equals to the mass times the velocity, should be a larger number than H, which is Planck's constant, divided by 4 pi. Okay, this is quite weird, right? We are getting into the realm of quantum mechanics and the quantum weirdness. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it made sense. See you in the next one.